This is the Asus ROG Ally Z1 Extreme. I bought this thing about two years ago and it's been one of my favorite pieces of tech to bring with me when I travel. This thing is still pretty specced out even by today's standards, offering an AMD Z1 Extreme processor, 16 gig of DDR5 RAM, really comfortable ergonomics for my hands, and an overall powerful and compact package that can run nearly all of my Steam library. I regularly have been taking this thing on planes and playing Dark Souls 3 in my seat, which is overall a great experience for me, but probably looks pretty dumb to people sitting around me. Ladies and gentlemen, this is your captain speaking. We're going to be experiencing some minor turbulence here. I'm a huge fan of the ROG Ally, and like I said, I've gotten a lot of playtime out of it, but it does have some major flaws that I'm hoping to address today with some mods. First and foremost, the elephant in the room is the battery life. And while this thing has plenty of power to play some of my favorite AAA titles, you're really limited to only like an hour and a half of unplugged playtime. So the first mod I'm really focused on is upgrading the battery from the 40 watt hour battery that comes stock in this thing, to a 74 watt hour battery, nearly doubling the size. Asus has already addressed this issue in their new models with the ROG Ally X having an 80 watt hour battery, but I definitely wanna bump my battery life here to get my playtime over that two hour mark. So I don't have to worry about it dying on domestic flights. The second flaw of the Ally that I'm hoping to correct today is the cooling. This backplate is pretty closed off and I've seen the CPU temps reach up to 90 degrees Celsius, which is not great for the hardware in the long run. And I got an aftermarket backplate that'll hopefully improve the cooling performance. The third problem is the storage. This thing comes stock with a 500 gig SSD, which in today's age is only good enough for like three to four AAA games. The Ally supports the small factor 2230 M.2 drives. So I'm gonna be bumping this from 500 gig all the way up to two terabytes. And lastly, maybe one of the most annoying things on here is Windows. While Windows gives you some of the most flexibility for using whatever game launcher you want, or even emulating games from other types of consoles, the pickup and play experience is severely hindered by the fact that Windows updates for like 10 minutes every time you boot it up. It just has a lot of bloatware running in the background, which I don't like, and it impacts my performance. And I've seen a lot of great reviews about this fork of Steam OS called Bazite. So we're gonna be wiping Windows off of this thing and booting up Bazite on our new two terabyte drive. So I have all the mod equipment to get this build underway. Let's go over to the desk and tear down this device. So for this build, you're gonna need three parts. I got all three of these on Amazon and I'll leave links below to each. First up is the handheld DIY backplate. I got this transparent clear one. And you can see here next to the stock base plate, it has way larger vents for cooling, which should hopefully help out with some of those high temps. Next up is the 74 watt hour battery pack. This little kit comes with the battery, a set of clippers for trimming your case, a few screwdrivers and a little guitar pick to pry it open. And then lastly, I have this Western Digital Black two terabyte 2230 drive. Before we open up the Ally, you're gonna wanna make sure you back up any local saves. I had a save of Dark Souls 3 that's not backed up to the cloud. So I made sure to go into the corresponding game folder and back that up to my Google Drive so I can retrieve it later. Okay, and now for the teardown, you're gonna need a couple dishes to hold some screws. Flip the device over and use one of those included screwdrivers to start taking off the six screws on the back. And then you can take that blue guitar pick that's included with the battery pack and just work your way around the outside edges. This is my first time opening up my Ally and this thing popped right off. Set the backplate to the side and we're gonna start working on the internals. First off, you're just gonna wanna take off this black insulating sticker that's covering up the SSD. And then we're gonna wanna go ahead and disconnect the battery. It has a little metal clip that you need to slide up and then the battery connector will pop out towards you. Once you have that disconnected, we're gonna go ahead and unscrew the current drive. So again, just use that little screwdriver and pop out the 500 gig card. We're gonna go ahead and swap in our two terabyte drive here. So just pop that into place tighten down the screw and you're good to go. So for swapping the battery, we're gonna have to remove the old one here. There's a ribbon cable that you have to unstick from the back of the battery here. I didn't end up removing this during my build, but it has the same little metal clips if you wanna do so during yours. For unscrewing the battery, there's four screws in total. You have to take off these two at the top, and then there's one on the right side of the battery, and there's one on the left as well. Now with those screws out, you should be able to just pop the battery out of its spot. Make sure you store this in a safe place. And if you want to dispose of it, I'm pretty sure you can bring it to Best Buy and they'll do it for you. So the next part's a little intimidating. We're going to have to take those clippers and trim out parts of the plastic case to fit the bigger battery. These two little boxes here I'm cutting out are going to block the larger battery. So just work slowly and use those little cutters to cut those little plastic squares out. Again, this seemed a little intimidating to me when I was watching other people do it online, but honestly, it's really not that hard. The clippers included with the battery kit did a great job of cutting through the plastic. And as long as you take your time here and make sure you're not cutting any cables or scratching any of the PCBs, it should be a relatively straightforward process. Again, just work slow. Make sure you're taking your time cleaning up all the edges. You don't want anything sharp to puncture the back of the battery. I did a decent job here to start. I'm going to come back and clean this up later in the video. And then lastly, we're going to take off this little pad that's covering this copper strip and just move it down like about a centimeter. If you don't do this, it's going to get in the way of your battery and you won't have enough clearance to fit it inside the case. And then you can see here, I'm just dry fitting the battery to make sure I trimmed enough away. 
Not trying to force it in here or anything, but just making sure that I have enough clearance underneath it to fit in the intended spot. Okay, with that done, we're gonna go ahead and move on to the back plate. So first off, we need to cannibalize our triggers and paddle buttons for our new back plate. The trigger assembly is just one piece held in by two screws. So just take those two screws out and the triggers themselves are held on by these little plastic pegs. So I just used a screwdriver to pop it off of those pegs and the whole trigger came out. For reattaching the triggers, I found it easiest to push down the trigger before you place it onto the pegs. This ensures that the little latch on the trigger will be pressed down and providing tension to the spring. And then go ahead and tighten those two screws back into place and go ahead and give your trigger a test to make sure it feels correct. And I'll show you guys here one more time with the other trigger. Just take the screws off, pop it out of the pegs, have the trigger pressed down and mount it to the new pegs, and then go ahead and screw the two screws back in. For the paddle buttons, these are a little bit more tricky. They have these disc shaped screws that you need to take off and there's a little spring underneath that might fly out when you do that. So just put that spring to the side and then inside of here, there's a couple little tabs you need to press in in order to pop the button out from the other side. I just use a screwdriver and press each of them and that button fell right out. And then for reassembling it, we're just gonna do the exact same thing in reverse, pop the button into place, making sure those tabs go through the correct holes, drop the spring into place, and then tighten down that screw on top of the spring. This button won't have that tactile click without being assembled, but just make sure it moves freely and isn't stuck on anything. And then I'll show you guys this one more time. Same thing, we're gonna take off the flat screw, pop out the spring, press on each of those tabs to push out the button, reattach the button from the backside on the new plate, drop the spring back in, and then tighten down the screw. So now your back plate should be fully assembled and look something like this. I also like that this back plate comes with a little kickstand on the back. So now I'm just dry fitting the battery on the back plate side. And with this specific plate, there's a few areas you're gonna have to trim out in order for this to fit. So these two squares here that I'm pointing out need to be cut off. So go ahead and take your clippers out and just start working slowly to cut these little pieces off. There's no cable or anything to worry about back here, but just make sure you're being careful so you don't scratch up the inside of your back plate. I also went ahead and removed these little ridges that were attached to the two squares, just to ensure that the battery would sit fully flush on the back plate. Again, I've said this a bunch of times, but just work slowly here and be sure to clean up any of those rough edges. After cutting, I'm just feeling with my fingers. I felt that it was still a little bit rough here, so I just went back with the clippers one more time and just tried to make the lines as clean and smooth as possible. And then you can go ahead and dry fit your battery again on the back plate, making sure that it sits flush. And one last thing I wanted to do here was just pop out this little thing that said handheld DIY. I didn't really like how this looked. So you can just take a screwdriver and just pop that out from the backside. It's just stuck on there with some adhesive. So before we do the final reassembly, there's a few more things we needed to do. Inside the battery kit, there's this little stick of foam. You're gonna go ahead and cut out two little squares to fit into these spots here. Just make them a little taller than the squares themselves so the battery has something soft to rest on top of and you don't risk puncturing out on these little plastic squares. And then we can go ahead and finally slide our battery back into place, just pressing it down to make sure it's all flush and then go ahead and take that connector. It snaps down into the PCB from the top. And then you're gonna go ahead and lock that metal clip. I found it easiest to just use my fingernail and lock it back into place. Make sure you go ahead and stick that ribbon cable back onto the back side of the battery. And since we have a clear back plate, we need to go ahead and cover this little light sensor here. So I just cut out a piece of black electrical tape. The little black square on the right has a diode inside of it. And you just need to cover that up with this piece of tape in order to bypass that light sensor. I forgot to record this part, but make sure you put that piece of black insulating tape over the SSD. And then you can go ahead and snap your case back into place. Just work around the edges, don't force anything. If you need to go back and trim a little bit more to make sure the battery's not bulging, go ahead and do that. But I did a good enough job here for this to go on pretty smoothly. And I went ahead and tightened down those six screws on the back. Once it's fully assembled, just give your triggers and paddle buttons a quick test to make sure they're working. And that should be good to go. And now we're ready to move on to the software portion of the video. So while we prepare the boot drive, go ahead and plug in your Ally so you can charge up the new battery. And then go ahead and plug in a USB stick into your computer. We're gonna be using a software called Bellina Etcher for preparing our boot drive. I'll leave a link in the description so you guys can download this. And then we're gonna go to the Bazite webpage, click on download Bazite, and then select your device from the drop down here. Here's the Asus ROG Ally and Ally X. And then go ahead and select KDE for the desktop environment. Then we can go ahead and click on download Bazite dash deck. And once that's completed, open up Bellina Etcher, click on flash from file, select that ISO you just downloaded Make sure your USB drive is selected in the middle here and then go ahead and click flash. After that's completed, you should see this screen here and you can go ahead and take your USB stick out of your computer. So we're gonna need a USB-C hub here in order to plug in our flash drive as well as a couple peripherals to help us set up the operating system. So I went ahead and plugged in the flash drive, a keyboard and a mouse to help us set this up. Go ahead and power on the device. And since our M.2 isn't formatted yet, it should boot straight from the flash drive. Use the keyboard to select enter on the first option here and you should be greeted with this Bazite install screen. Select your language and keyboard layout. This wasn't really in frame, but on this screen, you're going to connect to your Wi-Fi and make sure you select that two terabyte drive as your installation destination. 
After that, you can go ahead and click install in the bottom right, and we're gonna wait for this to finish up. After that's done, you should see reboot system here. Go ahead and click that, and you'll boot into this screen. So I dealt with this error here that said bad shim signature. So go ahead and reboot the device again by going back to the grub terminal and typing in reboot from the keyboard. And then as the device is powering back on, hold the volume down button to boot into the BIOS. You should be greeted with this screen here, and the setting we need to change is called secure boot, which we need to disable in order for Bazite to work. Again, I did a pretty bad job of recording this, but it's underneath the security tab and just go ahead and swap the secure boot drop down from enabled to disabled. Make sure you save your changes and it'll reboot once again and you should boot into this screen where you select your language. Go ahead and connect back to your network and then you're gonna log in with your Steam account here. After that's done, you should boot straight into your Steam dashboard and you can start installing your games and launching them from this screen. From this screen, click on the menu button in the bottom left, hit power and then switch to desktop mode and we're gonna run a few commands from the terminal to verify that our new hardware has been detected. The df-h command will show you your drives so you can see that two terabyte is detected there at the top. And then this command on the screen will show you your battery and you can see that our energy full capacity is now at 74.9 watt hours. Next up, we're gonna go ahead and retrieve our Dark Souls 3 save that we backed up to Google Drive. So go to Firefox and type in Google Drive and then download the .sl2 file to your desktop. After that's downloaded, open up Steam, right click on your game, manage, and then browse local game files. We're gonna back out of the folders to Steam apps and then go into this compat data folder. Click on 374320, PFX, drive underscore C, users, Steam user, app data, roaming, and then Dark Souls 3. And then inside the folder here is gonna be the fresh save file. We wanna overwrite that with the save file that we backed up from earlier. And you can see booting this up, we boot straight back into where we were before, back at Slave Night Gale. So I turn on the overlay for this next part just so you guys can get a sense of the temps and frame rates I'm getting. I'm running this on boost mode, so running at the full 25 watts. And you can see I'm getting right around 60 FPS with the CPU and GPU temps right in the mid 70s. The lower temps unfortunately didn't help me defeat Slave Night Gale, but you can see 72 on the GPU and 68 on the CPU is a lot better than the 90 degrees we were getting before. So that was my full overhaul of the Asus ROG Ally Z1 Extreme. Obviously this set of mods isn't gonna be for everyone. If you already have an Ally X, you're probably more than fine with the stock battery and performance. And if you're playing on something like a Steam Deck or a Switch 2, it's probably not worth it overall to be taking it apart and trying to upgrade different parts of it. But I have a feeling a lot of people are probably in the same boat as me with this device, where you're seeing all of these new handhelds coming out, like the Switch 2, and you really just wanted to squeeze a little bit more performance out of the Ally. Overall, I'm really impressed with how each of these mods performed. Obviously, the storage was a huge upgrade for me, and really probably one of the easiest mods you can do. I got the Western Digital card for like 150 bucks on Prime Day, and I'm sure I'll find a use for that 500 gig card in another project. Something I wasn't expecting to perform so well was the backplate. While running Dark Souls 3 with the exact same settings of 1080p medium graphics, I was seeing CPU temps anywhere from 10 to 20 degrees Celsius lower. I honestly wasn't expecting these vents to provide that much more airflow, but I could legitimately feel the device pushing the air through the back vents, whereas before it was mostly just exhausting out of the top. Now the battery is a mod I knew I was gonna be happy with. It really is the Achilles heel of the Ally, and I'm super happy with how this mod turned out. Trimming the extra plastic out of the case was actually pretty straightforward, and the device is actually set up in a way where it's pretty easy to take apart and reassemble. There's only really a few screws that you need to undo, and it definitely looks a lot more complex than it actually is. And then lastly, I think my favorite mod of the entire video was Bazite. This thing feels like a completely different device offering that pick up and play capability that I've been looking for. I love being able to have the device powered off and literally just press one button and I can boot straight back into Slave Night Gale beating my ass. Overall, Bazite had a really intuitive interface to navigate. I like the different options for overlays that you have to monitor your FPS and CPU temps. And I like that they included the desktop mode so you can switch over and manage your files like I had to do with my Dark Souls 3 save file. As always, if you have any questions about the Ally, different mods, Bazite, or any issues you're running into, feel free to leave them in the comments below. This video took a ton of work to build, record, and edit, so a like would be greatly appreciated. And I'll see you guys in the next one. Peace.